one of the things that really fascinated with fascinated myself was that being a pharmacist for pretty close to 23 years now, um, after 12 years of being in pharmacy, it wasn't until that time that I was introduced to this whole field of alternative therapies. I had actually had a belief that pharmacists and doctors were often the first point of health care for the general public. And the fact that uh, we didn't know all of this knowledge about antioxidants and um, plant-based minerals and the importance of having a healthy digestive system. It was very. It was something that I think some of the pharmacists or doctors might have a passing interest in, but I think what that did was fail to make people realise how important it was to look at a lot of those different areas. And and Robin, you've spent all of your time in the um, the Northern Beaches area of Sydney, dealing with these kinds of issues. So maybe you could give us a, a, a background of where you've been able to uh, come to through your experience. Yeah, certainly Stephen and I have to echo what you've just said that unfortunately in the background and training uh, and from my perspective as a medical practitioner there there is no or there was when I went through no training whatsoever uh, in nutritional and environmental medicine. The amount of nutrition that came in from memory, I think, might have been one lecture in biochemistry where it was briefly glossed over that maybe we needed 30 grams of protein a day to maintain nitrogen balance. Little bit of tip teaching on vitamins and minerals, and that was about it. And so uh, you left medicine with a very strong basis, a strong belief that everything was about diagnosing the disease, getting the right label for the disease, but then matching that disease with the right pharmaceutical drug to fix that. There, there was nothing about managing the whole person. There was nothing about lifestyle change. There was nothing about nutritional change and dietary change. There was nothing about looking into what was actually going on between all the different organ systems in the body that had resulted in this disease, about what was happening in the biochemistry in the background that had resulted in this disease. There was none of all of that. And and even these to these days now, it is still, for most doctors, a case of what's the name of this disease? How do I box it? What box does it fit in? Once it's in that box, what are the drug options to fix that box? Now, fortunately, there is a growing move um, towards looking to lifestyle changes, uh, towards recognising the effect of nutrition. And this is being brought about basically because of the diabetes and obesity epidemics, where the government are being forced to recognise that because of the massive levels that we're facing now, 50, 60 per cent of people now are being classified as, as overweight or obese. Diabetes is now thought to be affecting up to one third of people. If they tested, we'd find about 25 per cent of people in a, a pre-borderline diabetic or diabetic state. Dreadful figures, and it's only getting worse. And so the government being faced with the enormity of, of the cost of this and the enormity of the effect of this on the community is being having to being forced to recognise that this cannot be dealt with, with drugs. It's not a drug deficiency problem. It's, it's an uh, aberrant lifestyle problem. It's so, a poor nutrition problem. So currently we've got the, the system that, that I was initially trained in was basically a sick care system. So we would look after people who are sick and trying to uh, resolve those specific issues. So now we're actually looking at perhaps a a wellness system in being able to look at some of the issues that may be able to help us maintain a healthy lifestyle to to stay well to stay away from that um, the sick care system as much as possible I know from from my own particular experience I've been looking at three key areas and um, those are talking about the high levels of toxins that we're being exposed to um, the other one is the perhaps the deficiency in nutrition that is coming from the foods that we're expecting to provide us with the nutrients that we need, and then also the stress that we're being exposed to. So what would be your comments on those different issues? Certainly, again, I'd have to agree with everything that you have said. We have to move away from a disease model. Uh, the reality is that the diseases are increasing. The number of diseases are increasing. The, the uh, variety of disease are, uh, are increasing. We're finding more and more cases now of bizarre things that we can't fit into boxes. We have to move from a disease model across to a lifestyle wellness model because most of these diseases, some estimates say sometimes up to 60% of 
of the diseases that are being caused now are lifestyle diseases. They're related to the fact that we're not exercising enough, related to the fact that we're eating incorrectly, related to the fact that we're stressing out. Medicine hasn't yet recognised the huge importance of the issue of toxicity. In fact, in medicine, this is a, a bit of a, a bad term. You know, we, we don't like that term in, in standard medicine. Uh, it's a naturopathic term, really, a concept of, of toxicity and gut-based toxicity, but it's a real phenomenon. So we have to look, if, if we're going to restore wellness, if we're going to move away from disease, we have to look at a wellness model and we have to be looking at each of these factors. And each one of these areas is uh, an entire study on its own. The, the issue of toxicity these days is a much bigger question than it was before. Pre-industrial era, we didn't have to think about that. There really weren't environmental toxins around. Uh, you had to try hard to find something poisonous to eat it. But uh, as the industrial age advanced, as we started adding pesticides to the environment to, to knock off pests, uh, we added herbicides, we started adding additives into the foods because we wanted better shelf life, we wanted food that was uh, more accessible and cheaper and all of this sort of thing. Then the background load of toxins in the environment rose and rose dramatically. They're through the drinking water, they are everywhere now. Even polar bear livers now are contaminated with DDT. There is nowhere on this planet anymore that is clean. There are places that are cleaner, but there is nowhere that is clean. So toxicity and heavy metal toxicity is another silent killer. These, the thing about these toxins is that often they're hidden. We don't see them often, we don't smell them often, and we're not aware they're there, so we think they don't exist. So that's a hidden problem. Uh, but a major problem, the issue of toxicity. Obvious problems, stress is an obvious one. Uh, lack of exercise is an obvious one. We can easily see and deal with those ones. And the foods, again, is a whole separate question about the foods because we still have a situation where our standard dietitians are telling us that there's nothing wrong with our foods. We can eat all these, you know, eat these modern foods. They will give us all the nutrition that we need. That's a whole separate story. So, so coming back to what you were talking about, the toxicity issue, um, if I understand, all of the introduction of these new chemicals uh, post, say, the Second World War um, has basically over, overrun our normal mechanisms to be able to detoxify. So that would include things like even just um, being able to have things coming out through our digestive system, processed via our liver and kidneys, uh, coming out through the skin, um, through sweating, and I know that there are a lot of different modalities that can actually be used to help the body's natural mechanisms to detoxify. Could you maybe explain some of those and you know, which ones have proven to be more successful? Yes. Uh, again, you know, you've, you've covered the bases very well, and that's exactly what has been happening, that as the load of environmental toxins has increased, it's like it's hijacked our body's innate metabolic pathways, the pathways that were already established in us to deal with toxins that just came and incidentally through eating food that was a little bit off, toxins that came as a result of our own body metabolism. And those, those pathways have been overloaded with the body having to deal with all these environmental toxins so that we end up with a situation in modern society where the liver, particularly the liver, this is the major metabolic organ where this, uh, this metabolism occurs, this detoxification process occurs is so loaded that often it can only move to a first step of detoxifying these, these products, these toxins, which actually leaves them in a stage where they're often even more toxic than they were before the liver did that first step. And the body is stuck with these things which it can't often excrete then through the gut because the gut is, is impaired because of too many antibiotics, so the gut bacteria are no longer healthy, and so the gut is not successfully dealing as, as it should we don't, water is a basic thing that we need to keep washing our systems out and flushing out. We're not drinking enough clear water. We actually add more toxins with our water. And so we end up in a situation where the body is full, as it were. And so the body seeks to put these toxins, if it can't deal with them, it can't metabolize them, it puts them in all sorts of places. So these toxins can be stored in the body fat. For some people, the body is actually storing body fat, not just because of lack of exercise, not just because they're eating the wrong things, but because they're toxin loaded and the body's trying to get rid of them somewhere. Other people, they'll puff up with fluid. And toxins do go into 
storage in the various organs. So, so there's a real toxin load scenario problem. In terms of clearing toxins, there, there are lots of things that we can do and we need to do. And there's no one thing that I would say is really more important than others. It's more that there are lots of different ways that we need to address that problem. We have to reduce the toxin load going in. So we need to be drinking pure, clean water to, to reduce the load coming in through water and actually helping the body flush out. We have to reduce the, the gut load of toxicity. There's, if we have sick gut bacteria, which most people do, antibiotics that they've had for illnesses, antibiotics coming through, again, the foods, through the water, then the gut bacteria, instead of producing good things for us, are actually producing more toxins. So they have to get the gut bacteria corrected so the gut can then start be a source of good things rather than bad things. The foods themselves, we need to change our foods from foods that are toxin loaded with additives, preservatives, colorings, flavorings, you know, the list goes on, fake foods, numbers that you don't even recognize. We've got to go back to real food. Studies have shown that, that people, kids in particular, who eat organic foods, the measurable level of toxins in their body actually reduces. So we need to go back to eating chemical clean food, preferably organic foods. That will help reduce the toxin load. But after we've done those things, then we need to be looking at, at ways to support the liver function. And you know, people hear of liver detox diets. And, you know, but uh, we do need to be looking at ways, there are particular nutrients that promote liver function, particular herbs, certain foods. We need to be looking to those to help the liver start clearing this backlog of things that are in the body and to correctly metabolize. Once we've done all those sorts of things, then we can look at there are extra methods. There are things like sauna bars, which encourage you know, the toxins to come out through the sweat. Foot, particular foot bars, which encourage the toxins to come out the feet. There are other supplements that can be taken. There's a, there are different types of things for chelation to help pull heavy metals out of the body. So there are lots of different ways that we can work through this process of detoxification. And, and it's not a rude word. It's, it's a real process. But it's all about, there are two phases, I guess, really. It's about three phases. Reducing the amount of toxins that are coming in, enhancing the body's natural toxic uh, metabolism and excretion methods, and then using extra things that will help pull the toxins out without the body necessarily doing the work. So there are three things that we need to look at. Now, you were talking before about the obesity epidemic and um, how the body stores toxins. So what you're saying is that that could be a mechanism where if your body is actually attempting to store the toxins in the fat, that if a person is actually trying to um, go on a program to um, basically you know, remove their excess fat, that the body's not going to actually release those toxins. That's, that's exactly correct. We've got quite a large number of patients coming through our clinic where we found that precise scenario where either the body will not release the toxins until we actually have detoxified them, or as they try to release and burn their fat, they become really sick from the release of those toxins. So depending on that person, it can, it can be an either-or situation. But generally, the body we, we have a phenomenal amount of body wisdom that has been just put in us in how we made. And a body will not release stored toxins if it can't cope with metabolizing them or it will only release them to a certain amount and, and otherwise people get too sick and, and many people as we've seen this if they stop drinking coffee they get a hangover you know um, you stop smoking you, you get effects because the body then starts to try and clear the stuff and it can make you sick. Now one of the products that I've most recently been exposed to is a, a liquid zeolite product which one of the fascinating things that I discovered was going beyond the basic mechanisms of action but um, they were talking about how it could remove the the heavy metals like say um, mercury and also uh, things like uh, arsenic and um, I was looking at some information that was saying that the the mercury was able to be removed from receptors in the body that would normally be taken up by magnesium. Now what I found fascinating is that mercury has a two plus positive charge and so does magnesium. And there's the same kind of example with uh, zinc in the body which most people would recognize as being beneficial for the immune system. We take zinc lozenges when we're trying to 
help um, recover from a cold. But um, that the arsenic has a two plus charge as well. And those, the heavy metals would go in and block the natural minerals from doing their correct functioning. So in, in the magnesium example, it wouldn't allow our correct muscle function. So you're ending, ending up with a scenario where if you don't have correct muscle energy, you could be um, dealing with conditions like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue. Um, and with the zinc example, if that correct functioning of zinc is not allowed to take place, you don't have a correctly functioning immune system in that particular area. So what is it seems to be allowing to happen is release releasing the body to return to its normal function. Basically, all of those minerals that should be coming from good quality uh, plant food sources that are providing the nutrients in an absorbable, an absorbable form can now get to the receptor sites and allow the normal metabolic processes to take place. I mean, certainly we're learning a lot more about the effect of heavy metals in the body. Um, and mercury is uh, really coming to the fore because mercury was used as a preservative in vaccines, particularly for children, for many years. Uh, it's also in adult vaccines still now, it's in flu vaccine and vaccines like this. And mercury has been implicated in the development of autism of which we have an epidemic in this modern age. But we've got evidence that mercury does influence the, uh, the immune system adversely, can promote autoimmune disease. It can treat the, the list of mercury system, uh, symptoms is very, very long. Mercury toxicity symptoms is very long and it can mimic a whole heap of things. Years gone by, syphilis was the great mimicker. You might have heard this, but this was something that we used to medically would say it, it's the great mimicker, but really mercury is, is a great mimicker. Mercury toxicity will mimic a whole heap of other disorders because of this ability of it to get in and displace, partially because of its ability to get in and displace our necessary nutrient minerals from their normal binding sites. And that is going to affect nerve function, brain function, it's going to affect immune system function, it is going to affect endocrine function right throughout the body will be affected where this is the problem. Well, I was reading how um, magnesium has they they know that it has 300 different biochemical reactions in the body that's what we know now and that's just for one mineral and there are many many minerals in the body so if all of those are going to be displaced or affected by mercury it starts to explain why a very very simple uh, toxic exposure and you were mentioning about the vaccines um, even I was talking that the highest level of mercury is actually coming from natural volcanic eruptions around the planet. Yes. So they can That's be right. happening under the sea. Um, the right. smaller fish eat the bigger fish. So we're even without being exposed to the extra things that have been added through you know, modern lifestyle, you know, amalgam fillings and stuff like that, um, we're still being exposed. So it's something that, that everybody needs to be aware right. of. Yes, very, very much so. Again, as I said before, awareness of this is increasing, medical, medical awareness of this whole issue of heavy metal toxicity is increasing. And it's not just mercury, cadmium is a major issue as well. And cadmium is an issue because it's your, your major toxic mineral in your side stream cigarette smoke. And passive smoking is a, a big problem. So cadmium, rather like mercury will displace things, cadmium particularly displaces zinc. And zinc we need, it's 200 different enzyme systems for zinc. We need zinc through the immune system. We need zinc for neurotransmitter function in the brain. We need zinc for correct gut function. We need zinc for many places. So th this whole thing of toxic minerals really is something that we need to become more aware of. We need to learn where these things are coming from, but we also need to look at the different ways of how to protect ourselves from them. So it's, it's um, what fascinates me is how complex the body is and how we as you know, scientifically minded people are making um, maybe a, a, an unwise assumption that we know exactly what's going on and being able to take it back to the, to the very very simple mechanisms um, like say for if you take an analogy with a motor vehicle quite simply you will do the regular things the regular maintenance things to allow a car to function properly and allow it to to last as long as it possibly can. So regular oil changes, regular filter changes. 
So we really need to be making sure that on a, on a daily basis, we are making sure that we're supplying all of those um, materials because thankfully our body has a mechanism to replace basically every cell in the body on a That's very right. regular basis. That's right. It, it is phenomenal how the body does this. I like and the analogy I often use for people is one of a, a, a beautiful, we'll say a temple, but a beautiful building. We have the architect's design. This is the blueprint that's in our DNA. So we have the original design. But that design has to get across to the building. And that building is meant to last for a long time. So if the design to get to the building and that building to actually be what the designer originally envisaged, we need the right materials, beautiful quality materials if it's going to be a beautiful building. And so those materials come in our foods and, and extra supplements perhaps in modern society that we need, but it's the foods and the things that we eat that provide those materials. And then we need good foremen and builders who are going to put it together. And that's where the part of the enzymes come in, that's where the part of a functioning nervous system comes in to get the messages through the body to put this together. So if, if the builders aren't working properly because we didn't feed them that day, well they're not going to do a particularly good job. If the materials are lousy, then the final building looks nothing like what the original architect's plan was. And even once we've got this beautiful building, it then has to be maintained. It's not going to stay beautiful if we don't take care of it, if it's not cleaned regularly, if we don't put back in another piece of stone where one's chipped and fallen off or something's broken in the ceiling, we don't fix that. Similar sort of analogy. We need all of these steps all the way along and then ongoing maintenance afterwards to keep this how it's originally designed to be. Now one um, area that I um, touched on early on was um, relating to stress um, because I find even when people do seem to do all of the correct things, they eat the right foods, they're doing the best things for detoxing, but it seems that the levels of stress are not perhaps given as much credibility or as much um, a credibility for sort of the effect that they may have. Um, I think that there are a lot of people that are really perhaps expecting too much of their bodies. They're not getting enough sleep, not enough rest. Or on the other point, they're actually exercising way too heavily. I mean, I used to compete at a very high level and I used to always be aware of hearing some of these elite athletes who just before a major competition, and Grant Hackett was one of them before the Commonwealth Games in Kuala Lumpur, he was talking about how he developed glandular fever. So it seems that if people are not aware how much of an impact that's going to have on their body, they could, again, pay the consequences. Yeah. Stress is a very major component in modern society. I mean, stress has always been with man, but centuries ago, the stresses, stressors were different. There were genuine physical stressors. A tiger was coming or, you know, they had to fight something off or their crops had just failed and, you know, they were about to go without food. Very different sort of stressors to what we have in our modern society. You know, it's not so much the stress itself, it's also how we handle it. It's also about the perception of stress. You can have some people who have a whole heap of stuff going on in their lives, but they've learned how in themselves to be at peace. They learned how in themselves how to be content. They don't need things stress them. So you measure them and their hormone levels are very different to the levels of someone else who is anxious and uptight and stressed. Certainly sleep, basic issue coming, uh, there's a, a concept that I've helped develop called the Healthy 100 concept which is, is a wheel with a, a central axle, the idea that a wheel when it's even rolls beautifully and one of the key things on that is peaceful rest. We have to be having peaceful rest. I find it interesting and I like looking at ancient documents and ancient wisdom and, and the Bible of course the, the tenet, one of the first things is that God, God makes the earth, makes it in six days but on the seventh day he rested but God doesn't get tired. Why does God rest? He doesn't get tired because this was a day to enjoy all of what he'd done and, and this I think is something that we've often lost in our society. We're so busy getting, so busy doing, all of which might be good but, but we're not taking that time out just to rest and enjoy what we have done, what we have got, to enjoy our family, to, in, to enjoy. And we need to be taking that time. It's a great little verse that says, be still and know that I am God. And this idea of being still, we're not doing this be still bit. We need to do more of that, of being still and finding God 
whatever form people you know believe themselves but finding that place of, of peace and contentment that doesn't depend on the things so we're, we're looking not just at the physical stress but also the mental stress and the spiritual stress so very much looking so. mind body spirit basically very much so we are mind body spirit we can't we can't separate them we live on those three spheres simultaneously and it, it's it's phenomenal there's a, a, the work of a US scientist by the name of Candace Pert a few years ago discovered some things called the molecules of emotion and this this I love this because it just fits so beautifully to this whole mind body spirit thing so these little neuropeptides these little uh, molecules of emotion that are nerve acting they carry literally carry emotion around the body and deposit in different organs of the body we cannot separate our emotions in our body if if we are the old saying liberish a liberish person is someone who's angry and irritable and resentful and bitter it's interesting that those emotions in chinese medicine concepts those are the emotions that lock in the liver we get liver dysfunction people become liverish so th these old sayings that were around a long time ago they, they actually caught the essence of this so we we are mind body spirit simultaneously what we feel affects how the body works how the body works can affect how we feel where we are in our spirit can influence all of that what is your experience about um, the impact or, or the the story about cholesterol and how that fits into the whole stress uh, equation it's a very interesting one of course we've, we've been told for many years that the cholesterol is a baddie it's, it's a cause of our heart disease we, we mustn't have it we have to get rid of it we're not allowed to eat any of it it's a lot more complicated than that we actually make cholesterol in our own livers and we make a lot more than we can be getting from our diet and we actually need cholesterol. It is the, the backbone, if you like, for all our steroid type hormones, all the, the, the sex hormones are all derived from a cholesterol base. So as our bodies get more stressed, I mentioned earlier about cortisol is, is a stress hormone that comes from cholesterol. As our bodies get more stressed, we are going to be making more cortisol. We are therefore going to be making more cholesterol to make our cortisol. And so it, it actually is more of a marker of what's going on in the total body's health it's a marker of how much the body is making rather than necessarily this person is eating too much cholesterol indeed eggs which are high in in cholesterol and are supposed to be so bad for us are actually amongst the best foods we should be eating we've got studies showing that people eating eggs it makes no difference to their cholesterol levels what it does do though is raise some of their other vital carotenoid levels lutein zeaxanthine things like this to protect the vision so it's just not quite so straightforward a story uh, as it seems to be at all. We do need cholesterol. So it's, it's more about, again, looking at this whole thing of what's going on in the total health of the person. I did actually notice in some uh, literature that was sent to us about cholesterol, um, saying almost along those lines um, that even from the medical point of view, that the doctors should not be looking at cholesterol in isolation as a marker for somebody's health that you should be looking at other markers that are linked with cardiovascular disease because um, may maybe this is a um, a slight change in opinion and people recognizing that cholesterol is is actually a good thing it's it's what we need I mean just as many people die from heart disease or heart disease related problems with a high cholesterol as do with a low cholesterol so um, and there could be an interesting shift. It's beginning. The shift is beginning. The recognition is beginning to come that the, the wonder drug statins which reduce cholesterol and therefore are saving lives might not be doing it because of an effect on cholesterol. There's something else these drugs are doing. Um, the, another thing that's quite interesting is um, we've talked about being able to remove toxins to increase the absorption of nutrients. But uh, one of the things that is key is that we must have a, high, a healthy digestive uh, tract to make sure that we have the correct absorption of nutrients. So what's your experience of um, things that we can do to help improve our digestive system? I mean, certainly you know, the gut truly is the centre of the whole body. There are more cells, bacterial cells in our gut than there are cells in our whole body. So if we don't have the right bacterial cells then we're not going to have good digestion because wrong bacteria are going to actually cause a, an inflammation of the gut lining and stop the cells producing the digestive enzymes, it becomes very complicated. So we do need to be looking at that. 
restoration of a diet to a, a, a more primitive style diet with lots of fruit and vegetables, lots of soluble fibres, soluble, soluble fibres are the fibres that you find in a whole heap of your fruit and vegetables. These soluble fibres do actually feed the correct gut bacteria, they, they help line the, the gut so that things work better and they provide nutrients for these bacteria. So a, a good fibre diet, it's not the same as the old, people won't remember, oh yeah, wheat bran, it's not the same story as the old wheat bran, which is an insoluble fibre that years ago we were told we had to put on foods. We're quite different fibres we're talking about now, we're talking about things like apple pectin, we're talking about that comes from apples, inulin that comes from Jerusalem artichokes, so all these sorts of things, very important. Uh, and we can also go a long way by using traditional fermented foods, by getting people to go back old-fashioned sauerkraut, yogurts, but better old-fashioned kefir, which is a traditional European sour milk product, old-fashioned stocks and broths, all of these other sorts of things where we're, we're actually putting in nutrients that will help the gut. The thing about the stocks and the broths is you, you boil up your, your bones for a long time, the nutrients from the cartilage actually help feed the lining of the gut. So there's all these things that we can look at. Now, you're mentioning a, a, a wide range of different things that can provide nutrition for the gut. Um, I am starting to hear a lot of different um, raw materials that we can actually use as, uh, for example, in supplements, um, whether they be juices or tablets or powders. Um, that which ones should we be using? Oh, no, that's, that's a very... That, that, that's a difficult question. Um, there is such a wide range. As, as you know, you know, you look at your stores and you find all these things. I think what we need to do to work our way through that, we need to think in some basic concepts and, and stop and think, well, the things that we first discovered were vitamins and minerals, and we synthesized them. We got them made in a, a pharmacology lab, basically. So they are not actually exactly the same as the things that we find in foods. They're a copy, if you like, but they don't have the same life. They don't have the same other things as the nutrients that we find in their food form. In food form, you get multiple nutrients altogether, not just a dose of vitamin C or a dose of vitamin A. And this is part of the problem with the study that they did with beta carotene with smokers, which everybody has heard how beta carotene caused smokers to die of more lung cancer lots of problems with that particular study but one key problem is that they used an isolated nutrient eating a whole range of organic whole foods we don't ever get an isolated nutrient so if we're talking about carotenoid supplements we don't just want beta carotene we need to look at lutein we need to look at zeaxanthin we need to look at all of these other carotenoids that that come in that same family that work together so, so there's a move away from just vitamins and minerals across to recognising that within foods, within plants, there are a whole heap of other substances called phytonutrients, plant-based nutrients. It's a whole new category of, of um, biochemical research. And we're learning that these phytonutrients work in conjunction with the vitamin C's and the vitamin A's and so on. But they have their own actions. It turns out that these phytonutrients are what the plants, when they, the plants are organically grown, naturally use to ward off infection. Sounds funny, doesn't it? But the plants actually use these to ward off viruses, to ward off fungal infection, to chase away insects that would, would eat their, their plants. And so these phytonutrients tend to have very potent effects on the immune system as antioxidants and in various other systems of our body. So there's a move away from just having vitamin mineral supplements across two supplements that contain more by way of the phytonutrients. So we're talking about what you might say would be the micronutrients. Um, and this is in addition to making sure that we get a balance of our macronutrients like the, right. uh, the amino acids from the proteins. Yes. We also need to get our carbohydrates for energy and also the essential yes. fatty acids from the good quality fats. And yes. uh, that's another very big topic about um, yes. how important it is that we get the right fats into our system so that That's our right. natural again our natural mechanisms aren't blocked by trans right. fatty acids and um, right. you know, synthetic components exactly so the whole story is, as we talk more and more what we what we're saying really is that it's we're talking about needing to restore as far as possible our way of life but our food to the foods 
that were originally made. Not, so back not to the, basics. Back to basics, back to real food, back to food that man has, has lived with for centuries, traditional foods, um, foods that you can recognise as a food, that when you read the back of the packet, it's not a whole heap of numbers. I remember a friend of mine telling me uh, this statement that it's not for the chosen few, but it's for the few who choose. And I certainly, having been exposed to all of this information, and a lot of the subjects we've just glossed over, but um, I've certainly chosen to be proactive in knowing as much as I can. And um, it's really, for some people, they might be daunted with all of this information that we've been talking about. But uh, I liken it to a motor car again. Um, I don't know exactly how a motor car works, but if I have people that can help me guide, guide me to the right information, the right ways to look after my vehicle, I can just jump into it and turn the car and all of those functions will occur. And a lot of the functions happen correctly in our body if we do provide them with all of those components. So I guess in a later discussion we can talk about some of the specific solutions that we've been looking at that can can help us on our journey to wellness. I look forward to it Stephen. Thank you.